we do actually have time for a few questions. I don't know if folks were inspired to ask a question or two of Rose while we have her. How many home gardeners do we have in the audience? Just curious. You were preaching to the converted. I'm going to go Leslie and then Suzanne and then Linda. Well, one of the things I like to do is debunk uh, the idea that we're any busier than people would have been on the home front in World War II. Um, that whole thing about the nuclear, fa nuclear family in World War II is really made up because actually it was called the Grandma's War because women uh, returned to work in droves. And uh, that was the, a period of enormous dysfunction in American life. And, and by the way, the, the divorce rate after World War II skyrocketed. Um, and people found time to do it in World War II when you had people really working around the clock um, in apartment buildings. You would have a bed that was shared very frequently by three people who would just take turns sleeping in the bed and shifts. I think um, if it's a priority, we will do it. We have to do it. But that's a good question. One of the things that's really interesting for me is um, I, I don't like war, but as a home front historian, I find myself its constant student. I can't agree with you more that we need to reframe it. And what I suggest to people is that you consider it victory over obesity or community hunger. You call it a peace garden, you do whatever you want to do, but that it represents a victory for us to reclaim the important part of everyday life that it ought to be uh, that we cultivate some part of our food so that we have an understanding of, of how we're able to survive. Um, the USDA policies, again, you know, a lot of these uh, emerge as part of the New Deal and out of the Great Depression, and they were good, but I think that, you know, I mean, technically, I work for a cooperative extension. We, you know, sort of technically are beholden to USDA. It, it, this stuff has not been adjusted, and, um, you know, what's kind of interesting, too, is that, you know, a, a lot of the foods that we would deem as being healthful and desirable in a diet are not available through the programs. And uh, again, when I think of, of restructuring uh, in fundamental ways American public policy and American public life, I would start with the USDA and the food system. Um, again, I think these things have sort of gotten twisted and warped over time, and we haven't revisited the rationale. So I think those are really good observations. Sure. Sure. One of, uh, one of the reasons that the World War I program uh, caught hold so quickly is that America was emerging from a very strong period of, of, of social justice and reform from the progressive era called the vacant lot cultivation movement. And so you had these uh, cities in the 1890s, early 1900s, packed with immigrants, simply unlivable people starving, dying, literally, of starvation. You have underemployment um, and all sorts of issues with immigrants not able to make a living. And so there was a really wonderful guy. He was the first socialist mayor in the United States, Hazen Pingree in Detroit. And he came up with this idea because, of course, there were no publicly funded social networks to help people out. You know, we didn't have Social Security and that stuff. And so he came up with this idea that we were going to do in Detroit, gardening, uh, uh, for reform and and basically to prevent civil unrest. So he came up with this vacant lot cultivation and there were companies like uh, U.S. Steel and Carnegie who had, uh, you know, workplace gardens for decades, you know, through World War II as sort of like a social safety valve. And the vacant lot cultivation idea took hold so strongly that very quickly in typical progressive fashion, and we are the new progressives, by, by, by the way, we are that, that new generation of, of reform reformers and progressives that, you know, takes its lineage back to Seneca Falls and, you know, the anti-slavery movement. And, you know, then those people moved into all sorts of other things. But this vacant lot cultivation association was national. And what's going on right now um, that actually I'm, I'm getting lots of calls about is people are starting to do vacant lot cultivation again. They also call it guerrilla gardening. But this idea actually changed uh, understandings of private property law and some legislation was actually rewritten that gave people the right to garden 
on private property if it was slacker land and also in easements that were owned by railroads and utilities. And so I, I, I think that, um, yeah, that, was, that, that exists in American life. It was a super strong movement for about 20 years. And I think that could provide a very good sort of non-wartime context. I think that the, the fundamental question for me is why isn't it a national priority to be expecting that we would be giving the best that this nation can produce agriculturally, which I, you know, there is no other nation that has the agricultural, you know, the, the, the productive capacity we have. Why we're not giving the best on our plates to the youngest, most defenseless, you know, people in society and why we wouldn't take the long view that um, it's not elitist to want every child to be able to access a farm fresh salad bar. I mean, I, I get that challenge a lot about elitist, you know, versus triage. And one of the things that's really concerning me now is I was at our local community food bank last week and boy, you know, there's not very much there right now, and what's there is really processed. I mean, there's there's nothing you you know, you, you'd want to feed a kid. Well, thank you, and you know, I have lots of really annoying historical things on my website, so go there. I don't think anyone would find them annoying at all, Rose. Thank you so very much. What a treat. Thank you.